parents in this lovely audience? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that sounded truly sleep deprived. Uh, uh, for the rest of you, this performance is essentially contraception. Um, <laughs> so I'm, I'm a neuroscientist by training. So as far as I'm concerned, all the interesting stuff happens above the neck. Uh, so it was a really steep learning curve when my husband and I decided to follow the biological imperative to reproduce our genetic material um, or have a child, um, as it's more commonly known as. Um, and that's when we found out that we actually couldn't. Um, so we were told that there was actually about a 1 in 10,000 chance of us actually having a child. Um, to put that into context, that's about the same as the chance of having a really serious accident in the toilet. <laughs> um, so every year, there's, there's thousands of people ha who have really terrible things happen to them in the toilet. Um, so we didn't fancy our chance, chances, so we went to the doctor and we said, what should we do? And the doctor said, well, I think the thing to do is um, IVF. Um, does anyone here know what IVF stands for? Yes. 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 I'm, I'm not going to ask you. Oh, wait, you're done, you're done, you're done with your sausage. Go on then. <laughs> In vitro fertilization. Excellent. In vitro fertilization. But we didn't actually know what that involved. So, I, so we asked the doctor, you know, what does this involve? And the doctor said, for you, what in vitro fertilization involves is having to stick yourself with a big sharp pointy needle in your stomach every day to sort of, you know, zhuzh up your ovaries. Um, and then we're going to suck the eggs out of you in an extremely painful procedure. And then we're going to fertilize them and then we're going to stick them back up you in an equally painful procedure. And then he turned to my husband and he said, for you, what IVF involves is um, Here's a paper cup, and <laughs> here's a stack of porn magazines. Um, so everything about pregnancy and childbirth is deeply unequal, but IVF is like the most unfeminist thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> so we came home loaded with a box of needles and a box of drugs. Um, it was like the beginning of a party. Um, and I said, I'm not going to stick myself with a needle like some kind of junkie. The feminist thing to do here is for you, my husband, to put the needle in. And my husband was like, yeah, I'm, I'm a liberal metropolitan man. I can be all equal. <laughs> so he took out the needle. He held it aloft and kind of squirted it a bit. And he came closer. He came closer. He came closer. And then he went, yeah! <laughs> and he said, I'm having an anxiety attack. <laughs> I'm thinking of my safe place. I'm thinking of the paper cup <laughs> and the porn magazines. So I had to stick myself like a junkie. Um, and then we were faced with this sort of very peculiarly middle class problem, which is what do you do with a box full of used needles? <laughs> uh, there's absolutely nothing on the council website about how do you get rid of a box full of used needles in your household rubbish. So I went to the pharmacist and I was like, um, I've, I've, I've got some used needles, I'm not, not a junkie. And, uh, and the pharmacist went, use needles, <laughs> really loudly, use needles, you need to go to the needle exchange. <laughs> so what could I, a neuroscientist, um, possibly have in common with the people at the needle exchange? The needle exchange was full of people who were in the grip of a longing so strong that they were willing to destroy their bodies and go broke and even spend their time covered with bodily effluence, while I just wanted to be a parent, which is completely different. <laughs> so I went to the needle exchange and I felt completely at home there. Um, but there were sort of other indignities to come. So I had so many gynecological examinations that there are now people in Oxford who'd only recognize me if I flashed them. <laughs> so they don't know what my face looks like, but they know what my bits look like, which is really weird and really, really unusual for me. That's not usually how it goes down. <laughs> um, 
But on the plus side, I found out that um, I have a uterus which is so stunning in its textbook perfection that people would be, no, it's generally, people would be called into the room and they'd be kind of like, check out the uterus in her. I, I sort of had the womb with the view. I mean, there was just. I basically agreed to do this performance just to use that line. <laughs> um, so, but we needed cheering up because things weren't going well. And we had two rounds of IVF and it didn't work. And we started third round, it wasn't going well. And the nurse came in and said, well, the reason it's not working well is because you're already pregnant. Oh, oh it's such a lovely audience. And my husband just went, see, I can totally do an injection when it really counts. <laughs> Um, so it was all real, you know, it was all going to happen, um, there was the birth, the birth's coming up. Um, so I talked to my mother um, and I said, as a human female, what is birth like? I mean, she's also a scientist, this is just how we talk to each other. Um, and she said, giving birth to you was like having a really, really, really giant shit. <laughs> And having given birth myself, I don't know if she's the luckiest or the unluckiest woman in the world. I don't know if she had an exceptionally easy birth or if she has the worst constipation known to mankind. Uh, because for me, there was this, this stage in the kind of the second stage labor where I was like, this, this is supposed to be evolutionarily adaptive because right now it feels like a punishment from a vengeful god who really hates women. <laughs> So giving birth basically made me a creationist, um, which, is, which is really confusing when you're a biologist. Um, but there were sort of upsides. So gas in air is totally the business. So my husband had, had a puff, and he was like, we have to tell our friends in the needle exchange about this. Stuff. It was brilliant. Um, and at the end of it, um, we had a baby daughter, and my husband was holding her, and he was like, yeah, exactly. And, and then that's when she pooed on him for the first time. Um, so when parents tell you that they've never been happier before in their lives, it's because they've got Stockholm Syndrome. Uh, and you know, but, but, but there's good bits. So, so there's, uh, there's, a, there's a hormone called oxytocin which is released, and there's the bonding ho hormone, and you sort of hold your baby to your chest, and you sniff the head, and then you get really high. Uh, um, so for the first week, our, our daughter was called the baby bong, because we sort of sat in a circle, and we passed her around. <laughs> And the conversations went like, you know, yeah, you, you look a bit tired, let me hold the baby. No, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll hold the baby. Give me the baby, I want to sniff its head! Um, and that was my father, incidentally. He was basically doing drugs with my parents. Um, so at the end of this process, the thing I really realize is that being a parent is almost exactly like being a junkie. So as a neuroscientist, that's my conclusion. You're basically addicted to your baby. Um, and the other take home message I'd really urge all of you to pay attention to is that gas in there is the business. <laughs> I, would, I would urge the men in the audience to try and get someone pregnant just so you can be their birth partner and try the gas in there. So thank you very much.